I am a woman. I am a woman. I am a woman. I am a woman. I want to be successful. I want financial support. I want affordable health service. I want to be powerful. Powerful. Supported. Inspired. Connected. Educated. 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 I want specialized banking. I want maternal care. I want to be empowered. I am a woman. I am a king woman. I am a king woman. I am a king woman. I am a W woman. When I interviewed Mrs. Jumoke Adenowa for her King Women episode, it was actually the first time I ever met her in person. Now, one of the things that struck me about this woman is that she is intelligent. I mean, this woman is absolutely brilliant. And I think that is also the perfect word that describes this episode you're about to watch. Absolutely brilliant. Enjoy. I grew up in Ibadan. I grew up in University of Ibadan, really. Mostly on campuses. Most of my growing up was in University of Ife, because my parents are university professors, so I grew up on campus. It was a very sheltered life. Now that I think about it, it was really sheltered. It was a kind of environment where you walk to your friend's house, you ride your bike to your friend's house, gardens, no fences. It was very close go to school with your friends, what's nice. Go to the staff club at the, the weekend and swim and swim. It was really nice now. That's the kind of thing I want for my kids now. That's, that's where I live, where I do. I was very close to my parents because I was an only child for so long, for almost nine years. I remember that every year since I was, I could remember, I'd pray for a brother every single December 31 it was a huge thing because I really wanted a brother I really wanted a sibling because people would come and play with me because I had the most comics in the whole school so people wouldn't talk to me in school normally would come to our house to play with me and um, read my comics and everything so I wanted somebody on my and then when you'd fight you understand your friend who had two three sisters had people on their side and it was just you but my father and I were very close this was my mom but she had to be the one to discipline me the most because my dad wasn't doing it. <laughs> so that was it, growing up. And then we traveled a lot because I had to go with my parents everywhere they, did. they went, conferences and everything. So that influenced my study in architecture because at three, I went to Versailles, I went to Paris, went around Europe and all the great buildings influenced me. So I thought I wanted to be a doctor, but I actually I wanted to be an architect because I would say, I'm going to be a doctor. And the hospital building is going to look like this. And I would describe the hospital building in detail until it became very clear. I was not interested in medicine at all. It was just that thing that if you were good in the sciences, um, you would have to study medicine when I was growing up. But the confusion with me was I wasn't good in the sciences alone. I was good in the sciences and the literature and in geography and in history. So it was a bit of a mishmash. And architecture is that one thing that allows you to be able to be, be everything. We were loyal people, we, were, we weren't simplistic folk. We were good people, mostly, you know, growing up. So I was used to good relationships, good friendships. People say what they mean, intellectual people, intelligent people, intelligent discussions. That was it. That's what I meant, sheltered. I, wasn't, I didn't know young people get up to things, if you're on different things. I thought everybody was just like me. And I, I worked on that assumption for a long time. It was very, it was a serious wake up call, realizing that life was not the way I grew up with. It wasn't just like that. My mother is a sociologist, a professor of sociology, and my father is a historian. He loves to talk a lot, I think I took that from him. But um, they brought me up differently. They brought me up to have a voice to speak. There's a huge difference between someone whose father is involved in their upbringing and one whose father is not. And uh, it, especially with the ladies. The ladies, it makes you more assertive. 
So I can usually tell when a girl is close to her dad. She's more confident. She does not really, she's not afraid of authority. She does not mistrust of authority. She does not distrust authority. She, she, she's not looking for her daddy anywhere. So I can see that. So that's the way I grew up. I could tell my dad what I thought. At age three, I would travel with my parents, you know, at three, and give them my own point of view. And they pretend to listen at least. And I think they were listening, actually. And they still do. So that, that, that was there. And my mom was my first role model. It took a while for me to realize that she was my first mentor. She didn't have to tell me what a woman could do. She just did it, and I saw it. I mean, she was all over growing up, uh, vice president of International Sociological Association, this and that. She traveled more than my dad did, Tokyo, Budapest, Oslo. She was all over. I was 30-something before I realized that I'm a woman and it's a disability. It was in Katsina and someone was being turbaned or whatever, was being made, some chieftain's title. And I was trying to get on the podium so that I could see better. And the airman was sitting on the podium. So my husband, who is supportive, supportive, was lifting me up. And I got there, and this man looked at me, some SSS or something official from the north, looked at me as if I was something that the cat dragged in with disgust. If I could feel small, I would have said, can you see any woman here? Something inside me shrunk temporarily. I felt it was a crime to be a woman. You could see it in his eyes that he has been taught that a woman is, is a vile, is not on the same level as a man. I never encountered all of that growing up. My parents completely forgot to tell me that you're a woman, you're different, you're not as good as a man. They didn't tell me. My mom traveled a lot, but I, don't get, I didn't get that impression that she was gone a lot. Thought she probably was, but that's not the impression I'm left with. So she must have, a very, have had a very strong presence. Because I remember her being there every lunchtime, like about 3.30, we'd all eat together. So and dinner would all have together when she was around. It was a university campus. It was like 10 minutes to her office and back, back home to where we all lived. But the Petrified is a small word. It's too mild to say what I thought, you know, how I felt. She was my friend, I could tell her what I felt. But you don't do what she doesn't want, even when she is not there. That's a funny thing, even when she is not there. I remember somebody made me, someone said to me, one of the young st students who lived in her house, what do you mean you should be able to wear your mom's clothes to drive her car? So they made me wear her dress one day and I had to walk down to a store called Leventies that we had on campus. I was so scared. Every car that was coming was her car, as far as I was concerned. It wasn't worth it. When I was done, I go back home and say, you know what? I don't know what you guys get out of wearing your mom's clothes. I can't do it. The fear of my mom. And it wasn't real fair because I could tell her what I felt. But I knew what she didn't want. And I wouldn't do what she didn't want. In fact, when I got married, about two weeks into marriage, there was something I did and I thought, I wouldn't want my mom to, I don't want her to come and say something to me about whatever. Then it occurred to me, I'm married. She can't say any, she doesn't control me here. All the fanfare and everything was about that I'm gone and I can do things the way I want now. So that was cool. <laughs> I think I lost a bit of my childhood there because I was her confident and the things I had to cope with. I had to bear the burden of stuff. I can be blunt of her husband's infidelity with her. That was a bit much. You know, now I think about it. So I grew up and it had to do with issues. And I think I was a factor in between the two of them, really. You know, we used to prove a point and stuff like that. Well, yeah. It's good for people to know that I had a traumatic childhood. So I did. There were beautiful times. There were some serious rough spots. My dad and I are still very close. We're close. We grew up close. He could talk to me. I wasn't happy with the choices he made as a husband. But he wasn't my husband. He was my dad. My mom would draw me into her, you know, into her pain you know what i'm saying but he was still my dad so sometimes i might feel guilty for still finding him okay growing up sometimes i would 
would travel together, sometimes leave my mom behind. And you could tell him what you feel. And it was very, it was a lot of fun with my friends. My friends would secretly tell me, I wish your dad was my dad, you know. That was how fun he was. Really, you know, play, hide behind the curtains, play pick a book kind of dad. That was it. It was a whole generation of young Nigerian men trying to deal with monogamy and not doing it very well. That's what I realized happened then. And then they'll fall back on, eh, well, my father had two wives. Well, then why did you take her to the altar? Why go to Chapel of the Resurrection? Why did you do that? Why go to cuts? Why not just be like your father? What was all the shariat for when this is what you intended to do? And they didn't realize. They thought they tried enough. They didn't realize that. You make a vow, you should keep it. And if you don't, then you really should be very repentant. Shouldn't be others are doing it. You know, so I was caught in the middle quite a lot with my mom thinking now that I see it, what she thought was probably because I was female, I should be more, you know, I should be more empathetic, but I wasn't female yet. I was like new to gender. What does a seven year old know? I had no female feelings yet. If you get what I'm saying to understand her, I had to get married and understand what it meant, have my own children and then think about the mind boggling you know, implications of the things that went on. It was a lovely childhood for most of the time. I mean, we'd go away together. So this, I would have conversations. We used to have dinner and lunch together. A lot of the conversations were Marxism, socialism. I was the only world capitalist. I said it very early, I'm going to be a capitalist. I'm going to be a welfare capitalist. But you know, we'd have all those kind of conversations. My dad would talk about, uh, things used to quickly turn to their problem though. We'll be talking about Karl Marx and something and some moral imperative that somebody has to do something. Before you know, you realize that they're coding, they're coding to each other. They're saying something to each other, you know, and they're arguing over something completely different. Of course, with that kind of pain, we, it was basically a second wife at that time. With that kind of pain, it never goes away. It's always just there below the surface. And then my dad couldn't handle it. One of his friends, his mentor, a bishop, sent to me, very recently, this is what he told him. You want to have two wives and you can't have two minds. That you have to have two minds. That anybody who wants to deal with two wives must have two minds. That he was too straightforward then. He's put her away now, but it was too straightforward then to handle two women. That's just it. Too straightforward. So he was never fair. And that would, of course, always be there below the surface. Always. You know, just he would do something that would tick her off. And she would tell me, no, I wasn't allowed one moment without knowing. Yes. But we, we could work with it. We lived through it because my mom was not masking me from it. Do you see? So apart from that, it was fun when nobody's telling me anything that is going down. We were normal people. Normal people. For as long as I could remember, I kept praying for... I wanted any sibling. But I think the... Older I got, I needed a brother. You know, just, I mean, if we're going to wait this long, better be another gender, make it worth it. So I remember 1976, December 31st, I was singing and I felt in my spirit, I didn't know I had a spirit, but I felt inside me that 1977 was going to be different. And I was telling my mom that and I was singing, I was saying something is going to happen this year. And truly, apparently she got uh, pregnant in January, but how would I know that until even when she, she had a threatened miscarriage, and I knew I had to go call the doctor for her. I had to call Dr. Shubamu, the, the, the consultant ONG. It was horrible. It was, it, was, it was horrible. So I called, and then she had to be on bed rest for so long, from like the fourth month. Then my dad and I traveled away into Paris and some other places, and we left her. Now I think about it. I, oh, why did we do that? Why, why did we leave her? But they had come to an agreement anyway. So I, I, maybe I actually even traveled with my dad because there was nobody to leave me with. So we went. He had some things to do in Paris, and we were there for, for a while. And then my brother was born on the 20th of September in 1977. And I had a dream the night before that I was going to be born. So he was born. We went to the hospital. I was so happy that I was crying. I remember the names of the nurses. There's one called Tokwe. Beautiful lady, you know, fair, just very lovely. 
and I was saying thank you to everybody and they were laughing. I didn't know why they were laughing, but I think they found it funny that an eight year old was saying thank you. So I was thanking everybody around and I think in the end I took drinks to them or something. So it was, my joy exploded. I started taking care of it. That's what I realized. So I, I, it was like I had a baby. As far as I thought, can you imagine? Actually, we said when I had my brother, can you imagine? So it was like I had my, a baby. I really loved him. I still do. It was just, it was beautiful. It showed me God exists. This was living proof that there is a God somewhere. That the fact that, because remember, we're talking about the 70s here, early 70s. You didn't have one child, it was a failure. I'd go to a friend's house and if I did anything at all that smacked of being spoiled or indulgent, my mother would come home and cry with me watching her. It's because I really want child. I'm like, come. Now, the people she would, those role models are worse than I am. You know, she, she overcompensated for the fact that I was one. So she, we have a Yoruba saying that says, That means I'm not going to spoil this one. It's not going to make her 10 just because I'm spoiling her. So she was too aware that she didn't want to be reproved for spoiling a child. So that was, she was hard on me. But she should, I still got away with murder sometimes, but she was hard on me. Growing up, we couldn't play too much together, but it was more like, it was my baby and my responsibility, so to say. I always wanted to see him, always. And you know, I was in boarding school because by the time he turned one, I had to leave for boarding school. He turned one in September and I left for boarding school almost immediately or just before he turned one. So. It was that bad because I started boarding school at nine. It was time. I had finished second primary school. There was nothing left. Serendipitously, the university I wanted to go to was the one that um, my parents too wanted me to go to, which is University of Ife, which is where they were. So. That's where I applied to. Uh, VP, vice principal, probably had to go swear to jam that we were 16 or something before we could take the exams, but we did. And I got into it. My father had warned me that please do well because he was a proud professor. He was he used to talk, you know, and he had been dean of two different faculties. He finished with his faculty, then they took him to yet another faculty, which is not really done. So he was dean of arts, dean of admin, this and that. He was in senate, he was in council. So he said, you better not fail or get anything less than a cutoff point because I am not going to beg anybody for you to get in. So thankfully I got in on my own steam, you know, so it wasn't fair. Now what they did to mitigate my age was not to let me go to the hostels in year one. So I thought, well, year one, let me suffer it. Then year two, I said, so I'm going now. And then he goes, no. I'm like, ah, 15 again. I can't go at 15. They didn't let me go till I was 16, to my second, third year. I entered the hostel in my third year. So it was like being a day student. It was that I'd go to the, my lectures, stay as late as I needed to stay, and then go back home or somebody would come fetch me. But typically I'd go back home myself. It wasn't that tough. They have, there were buses and stuff like that. My faculty, they probably, I don't know, I don't think it was pressure though. I don't know, I was too busy. Architecture is tough. The first year, you, ha you do physics, chemistry, maths, and you do it with the main, that is, you do physics with the physics students, chemistry with the chemistry students, maths with the maths, it doesn't make sense. You don't need that much for architecture. What if it was like that? It was a very tough university where bright students get kicked out. It was famous for that. They call it facing road one or something like that. Road one is the road out. So before you know, you come in with nine A1s in those days, you're on road one. So it was really, I don't even know what it was about. It was probably about the survival of the fittest or something. Mm. Though I still remember the first time a boy came on to me, he was in a bad on a friend's house. And I realized what he was asking was, was na naughty or nasty. I was shaking, you know, I was 14. Why would he know I was going into university? I had Jerry calls, you know, so I would not know that. I was, I, hey, I went into shock. 
Why would I have crushes with what was going on in my house? Really? Crushes? Really? No, I was serious. No, crushes. I didn't trust men. As far as I was concerned, men are people who say something and do something else. So what am I dating him for now? I still don't get it. Guys are people you marry, she? Okay, at the right time, we'll do that. That was more of it for me. And then they were friends. I had a lot of male friends and they were safe if they stayed in the friend zone. Very safe. The minute you cross, I'll cut you off. If dating is to have a fun time with a friend, then he doesn't have to be a special friend. I had loads of that. Having, you know, eating pizzas, uh, pizza with friends, going out with friends. But it wasn't a special friend. He was a friend who happens to be male. If he had been female, it would have made no difference. So why go into a special zone with this guy? What is the essence of it? Someone needs to tell me. Either we plan to work out the modalities of a long-term relationship, isn't it? So what am I doing that for at 14, 15, 16? I'm in a seven-year course. What is the end game here? When we're talking about attraction and affection, there are grades of it. So you can like a guy. You like him as a human being. He could be Kemi. You know what I'm saying. So you like him. But what beyond that? There's another attraction level. You understand what I'm saying? That is what I wasn't getting into. I could have fleeting at, uh, attractions, maybe. I could notice somebody is fine. I'm not blind. I'm, uh, I'm straight. You know, but when you sit down, I need to think, so where is this going? If it's not going anywhere, why are you hitting on me? What do you want from me? Really? Is that what you want? Okay, thank you. You can't like me if that's what you want from me. Honestly, you can't. Maybe you know what I'm saying. You want to sleep with me because you like me? Oh, come off it. That's a no, no, no. You can't convince me that that's love. It's not love. My husband was my first real boyfriend. Others asked me, I told, of course, it was a problem. I didn't love them, so, you know. But I had people I liked, but that's not where our relationship was with. So until I left university, I started my business, and then I met my husband through friends. My friend, Bimbo, had married his friend, Tunde. And for some reason, she believed that this is Jumoke's husband. I was coming to Ibado to visit them because they live in Ibado and he was here in Lagos. So he was supposed to pick me up and bring me to Ibado. So Tunde came, we call him Kuzo. Tunde came to Lagos, maybe to the high court. He's a son now to the high court to do something and told me, oh, by the way, our friend is going to bring you down. But the reason was that they wanted me to meet him, okay, right? So this was um, Friday or something. And he told me, those days were the days of the rotary phone. There was no digital phone or anything. I didn't have his phone number, he didn't have mine. So they were going to give him my phone number so he could call me. This time I have my own little office in Oniko. Hmm? And I still remember the phone number. But as soon as they told me his name, I just saw in a flash what he looked like. Then I said, ah, I've seen him before. Was he at your wedding? This was December 17. This is about May. They said, yes. I said, he wore a bow tie. I thought to myself, gosh, that guy is not fine. Ah. I thought to myself, ah, and, it's, and I knew that it's going to be my husband. Ah, black boy. I was just doing like this in the photo. Because he was taller than most of them, so he didn't struggle to show. But he came across as snooty to me. Ah, Kai, and I'm going to my. So, okay. And it was that, so all that passed through my mind, but I didn't say a word. So, come Sunday, instead of going to my own church, I was living with my cousin, and his wife goes to Redeemed. I just was adamant in my mind, I'm not going to my church, guiding light assembly to that day. I just thought, I'm going to redeem. And they were having a joint service. So I said, I'll go with her. No reason. But I was too sure I wasn't going to my church that day. So we went and it was at TBS. And we got there. And the geo said, go around, greet your neighbor, do this, do that. Then I saw the guy, since I'd seen him in the flash, seriously, I had not seen any photo of anything of him, just that. So I recognized him from what I saw when Tudi was talking to me. So I went over and said hello to him, you know, and I said, did um, Kuzo tell you that you're bringing me to Ibadan? I said no, and I thought, oh gosh, nonsense. Why did I bother? And then at that time, because of the way I present, he thought I was at least 36. He thought I was friends with the big aunties and redeemed at those times, you know, at that time rather. So, so by Monday, 
Kuzo had called while he was in the office. So he came to pick me up. And we talked all the way to Ibadan and back. That's what really happened. We talked all the way to Ibadan. He didn't go home, sat with me in their house. Then the next day he was supposed to go to church. He went for some conference. He didn't go to church again, sat with me. Ah. But by that time, I had no shot that. But I wasn't showing it, of course. Because even when he proposed, I didn't say yes. It amazes me these days when people say, yes, 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 a thousand times, yes. I'm like, what is wrong with you people? Get a hold of yourself, Joe. It wasn't like that for me. I gave him a few days to stew. Even I was saying no, I just wanted him to seethe a bit. It was very rational that I knew that this is the person God wants me to marry. It was very important to me because I was not going to marry an unfaithful man. Mm -mm. I think I can take everything. So people have different criteria. My one was not G-Wagon, it has to be this. I didn't want him to be short, that's the only thing. Because I need him to be taller than I am. So that was my one physical thing. Uh -huh. Then there was that. So I had a, a, a checklist that was not too, not too much, just little. I didn't need him rich. Because I, nothing is wrong with my two hands. And I do not intend to be poor. So he doesn't have to be rich. He should just let me be rich in peace. That's what I needed. <laughs> so I knew that he obviously liked me. But they say a man chases a woman until she catches him. So that's the way it worked. He had no idea I knew. No idea I knew where he was going. So he really thought he was chasing me. In fact, the day he was going to propose, I had very clearly in my spirit, he's going to propose, it was a Thursday, he's going to propose to you today. Mafi Shako. And I thought, Mafi Shako, I, I tried deal. Why not? I'm a woman, isn't it? So he proposed to me. I remember as I was trying to propose, this pastor of Buki something was the pastor of Sovereign Army, kept coming in and sat down. And I had a feeling this guy wanted to propose. And it was gisty. Then he asked my husband where he lived. That one said, Ogba. He said, Kilo Nshe Logba. It was spoiling the situation worse. Because I was living in Iko, he was living in Ogba. Kilo Nshe Logba. said, this is now getting uncomfortable. Money garden. Kilo Nshe Logba. Kilo Nshe Logba. Kilo Nshe You know, he was just spoiling the man's case. You know, I was calm because I knew I was going. Then when he finally carried his penny and left. So he's been thinking about it and da, 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 da. Then he proposed, you know, he had become a Christian maybe two or three years before, 94 or something. This is 96. And there he is, still thinking it's even carnal to use perfume. Because he joined the redeemed at that time. He wasn't even wearing a watch because he thought it was carnal and fleshy. So he didn't even know what to say to me, you know. But he had to go ask my cousin's wife, told me that, can he say I love you because he loves me. So you can imagine, and I was there saying, this one can't even say I love you. And he's proposing to me, what is wrong? So I didn't agree, Sha. Are there many women who are keen on him at that time? They were, I know. I know some of them till now. They're not too nice to me yet. <laughs> were you jealous? Jealous. I wasn't at all. At all. In fact, when I meet them, I say, you should have married that one now. You see, you see God helped you. You know, that's what I say. So He's more fun. He was Mr. Campos. I didn't know that, by the way. In fact, the day he was contesting for Mr. Campos, I remember going to the sports center to pray. And I, as I was passing Ududua Hall, which is the main auditorium where the event was being held, I remember thinking to myself, what nonsense, what bish. And it would be a man now doing like this, wearing a pants. Can you imagine? I didn't know it was my husband. So it was two weeks to the wedding that my chief bridesmaid, Sheon, told me that, do you know Korede was Mr. Campos? I said, eh? So I went to ask him, were you Mr. Campos? That was the old me. I said, please. That's what we're asking. What I want to do, did you win? Are you sure you won? You know? So he said, I didn't know it was Mr. Campos. Honestly, we, he lived two doors ahead of, in front of me in university. We never met. That is how our worlds were so different. I was just not in his world. You know, there was the party world. My world was the other. A lot of women are underwhelming the men because they're not giving them anything to do. No chase, nothing. Because a man is a hunter. He needs to go after a prize. When you are easily defined, categorized, you can be nullified. Even when you're married, you need to remain ex exciting. Your husband must not be sure who you will be in any season of your life. So you have natural hair today, tomorrow you cut it, tomorrow you know. Then you have, 
you, you shouldn't know where exactly you will be at every time and what you're doing. You become boring. That's why men go after women that people think are not fine. But he's not seeing her as not fine. To him, she's exciting. You must have a purpose in your life that is beyond your husband. Once that man becomes a center of your gravity, you are caught, you are finished, you are nullified. He needs to go after another. I'd like to talk about emotions for a short while. Emotions are not reality. Emotions, first when we talk about falling in love, a lot of things that we call falling in love is infatuation. And it's a chemical soup. It's washing your body with hormones. And it happens because God is created in such a way so that man can, can procreate. So everything in you wants to sleep with that man and that man wants to sleep with you so that you can both have a child. That's the only way the human race, Homo sapiens, is going to continue to exist. But give it 18 months and things begin to cool down. Don't sleep with that man for 18 months and things begin to cool down. It becomes a more rational love. And that's the reason why we could marry early. Because we weren't sleeping together. So we had deep conversations. Day two, one, two, three, we were through how many kids you want to, this, that, what you want to do with your life. That. How much more is there to talk about? You understand? But if we were sleeping together, there would have been tensions. Did I do well? Did I not do well? Is he sleeping with somebody else? He looks at a woman, jealousy flares and everything. Did I like him? I liked him. But it was, there was something really rational about it. And I loved him. And I was attracted to him, which is why I didn't go visiting him. Because he lived alone. And the two times I was in his house, we left the door open. And his dog, Debbie, was at the door. And I think she thought he was, she was his first wife. That dog used to bark at me a lot. We had a wedding on a Friday and we had everything at once. Engagement and uh, wedding. Why? I will tell you now, you say I'm being too rational, but I will tell you. First, I just, it was a miracle that we had a wedding on a Friday. It was exactly one year after I prayed about her husband to the day. It was 26 January 1995 and I gave a breakthrough offering. From when I was 16, it had occurred to me, I'm going to get married one day and it had better be the right person. So not dating doesn't mean I'm not aware. Like I said, I was straight. I'm straight now. So I knew I'm going to get married. It is, I'm not doing trial and error. I have people who really, really like me. Some still do. I'm married and I see that they say like, did she really not marry me? I know. I know I can count. I was a realist. I wanted to, I wanted to get married. Marriage is good. It's just that you have to do it right. It could make you or break you. So I had to get it right. That was all. So I was serious about it. I'm not playing around with marriage. That's, that was me then as a child. I'm not, I'm not going to pray around with marriage. So I did pray at, uh, on the 26th of January 1995. And I said what I wanted, which is that list I gave to you. I said, this, this, that. You know, somebody first God, do this and that. And a year to the day, that very day we were getting married, I gave everything that was in my account that day, yeah. I had 30 naira left when I was done. And a year to the day, we were getting married. And I, I didn't know until we printed the cards. Because my mom like, who gets married on a Friday? What are you people doing? Then I looked and I realized what I had done at Winner's Chapel. One year exactly to the day. Now, why did we have everything on the same day? My auntie came to me, Auntie, auntie Kemi. What is it? Who does this? Um, are you giving away yourself like this? You know what? I find all those wedding ceremony things a waste of time. Especially that Yoruba engagement thing. It is so, you know what is going to happen. It's the, a drama with the same script. Isn't it boring? So, you're going to say exactly the same thing. It's only those in your gauge that are having fun, as far as I'm concerned. There's no, it's not a thriller. There's no plot. There's no suspense. There's no surprise ending. There's no twist. You know it. So my bag may tell him, forget it, Sha. I wasn't going to have it. And the only way to make sure that they were going to be quick is to make sure that I'll be able to say I'm going to church. So you have till 10 to 12 for all this Eric bed that you're doing. At 12, I need to leave you and I'm going to church. And that's what happened. They can do it in two hours. Is that you haven't given them two hours. It was fun. My friends came from Lagos. Some to just see who I was going to marry. Because at that time, the gist was maybe she's going to marry Jesus. Everybody's those things that she's saying, no, what does she want? You know, but they came. People came. The hall was so full. The, 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 the church was completely full. And the, the church came to tell my parents that they never collected an offering like that before on a Friday.
I love architecture and when it comes, I did get the first distinction in the history of the university. So it couldn't have been that bad, you know, I, it's, it's not that bad. So I was the only one sort of in my class. I was taking classes with others. So that was it. Then I did my master's in one and a half years or whatever, came out. I wanted to work in Femi Magic Academy Associates. I actually knew where I wanted to work. TCA for my internship, Femi Magic Academy when I'm done with TCA. So, and as usual, as they told me in TCA, they said, we have no space. So that's fine. Do you want to take a look at my portfolio? And then Imagine Prada looks at it, goes to look for the principal partner. And they say, we'd like to offer you a job. This time I'm getting cocky and I go, well, you said you have no space. I think right now that we're one of the best architectural firms in Nigeria. We're the most internationally recognized and our work is deep. If people want to reach into Nigeria for architects, they ask for AD consulting. They want me to write for them. They want me to talk about architecture in Nigeria. They want, you know, so something is going on in that space, definitely. And we do do good work. You know, but I'm just saying maybe that time wasn't so fantastic. Maybe it was being nice. In Femi Magic Academy, I took on things I shouldn't have taken on. That a youth copper shouldn't have done and stuff like that. I volunteered for work. I actually did, I pushed myself forward for work. I was so hard working, you had to give me work. The draftsmen used to look at me, that's the kind of thing. If you wanted to see me, then my toasters will come to, to, to the, you look for me, I was living in Koyi, you look for me at home with friends at that time. For me at home, you can't find me. You will come looking for me in, in the office at 11 o'clock on a Sunday, I'll be there. Because I love what I'm doing. So this is my own idea of fun. You know, so I'm there, we all see it, we gist, I'm working, they are talking to me, that's good. need to know your purpose very early in life and then you need to know where you're headed if a guy is intimidated by you right now in your Camry and you're headed for Range Rovers and private jets it's not gonna last so all this dumping down because of who you want to marry I will say to the ladies out there just be who you are you want to build a house build it you want to buy land buy land be yourself while you're waiting to get married because that yourself is what is going to attract the right person who fits that future if you have to dump down, then that man is not worthy of you. And he's not going to allow you to ever be yourself. So if he would not allow me to be me, he would have killed me. It wouldn't have worked. There are different kinds of women, apparent, perhaps. Maybe there are those who are eye candy and accessories. And there are those who really have something to achieve in life. And they know. So don't get, mix, don't, don't get it mixed up. So maybe the I'm candy need to go find some guy to hang on to. And those who actually feel that they, are, they were created for a reason by a God who knows them. And they're carrying something that will make an impact on this generation. Those ones owe their generation. So they need to marry a man that will let them deliver what they're carrying. So it's not about who he is as much as he allowing you to be you. Because you know you carry value, intrinsic. You are not looking for someone to add to you. You know you have something to deliver. So what you need is space to deliver it while still being a wife and a mother. So there is a male ego. What do you do? You be a tigress outside and you be a kitten at home because it's not possible for there to be two heads in any organism. So the house, the home can't have two heads. The man is the head, let him be the head. I don't know the noise about the head because there's a neck and it's wherever the neck turns that the head goes. So men should be very afraid when a woman keeps making things, you know you are the head, it's proof positive that you are not. She's manipulating you. <laughs> so most men, very funny, you know in this uh, society, it's like Asia and everywhere, where the wife is overtly different. She's the power behind the throne. So she will kneel and give you your food. But well, you can't say a word really without her. It's checks and balances. You have to understand that it's not just, it's universal. So they did this study in Harvard Business School and um, they, they, they described this audacious, go-getting, you, you know, very clear-focused individual and called him Harry. And you know, he was really making his way up the ladder. 
and they said, what do you think, Amahari? Harvard Business School. And people were saying, oh, he's very ambitious, he's good, he's this, he's clear, he's focused, he's everything. They took the same control group and then now call the name of this individual using the same egg, same story, no adjectives, right? Said, describe who this person is, but her name is Harriet. Nothing changed about the story. Oh, she's the B word, she is, she is nasty, she's cold and calculated. So what is ambition in a man is cold and calculating in a woman. Same scenario. She's cold and calculating. So she insists on what is right. She's loud and she's aggressive. He is affirmative and assertive. Do you see? So they see in an interview, my cousin tells me that she's watching it with a friend in the cafeteria, you know, with her colleagues in the cafeteria. Doesn't say she knows me. So they watch it and they go, wow, this woman is intelligent. She knows what she wants. She's everything. She must be a B. Ah. So when she told me, she said, she said, no. She's my cousin and she's very nice. But you know, I have a problem with it. I'm still struggling with it two years or so after. How do you look at a woman? What this guy has not said, I've done anything wrong. They've said, I know what I want. I'm very, very, I love excellence. I pursue excellence. Therefore, I must be nasty. Why? What in everything he has said qualifies me for nastiness? Who, who brought that one up? Let me say it now. Nah, I'm happy. I feel better. Who brought him up? Who are his role models? That for a woman to, to be excellent, she must be nasty. No. And that's it in this environment. If you insist on doing things in a particular way, as a woman, what is it? It's okay. It's true. It's just enough to just, you know, just be brand. If you don't give up, then oh, until it's too. That's what it is at the end of our teach, right? Or they say, we have done it for men, but everybody likes it that way. Well, I'm not everybody and I don't like it that way. What are we going to do? A lot of people mix submission with obedience. Submission and obedience are two different things. You obey because you, that's the act. Submission is an inward thing. Submission is about having power and deliberately dropping it. Del it's a deliberate act. You know you have it. You know you can deal with the situation. You know you can even deal with the man. But you're deliberately not showing how powerful you are. Because power is nothing without control. We know you are powerful, woman. Women are powerful. That's why they say there is no force like a woman's con. A woman has incredible capacity. And a lot of women marry men that they're smarter than. Or at least they can talk much more than you know what I'm saying we'll come to that later but what you need to do as a woman is when you want to drop it you drop it you know the end we have intuition therefore when a man is still rationally trying to decide if that business deal is going to go well you see the business partner you see the way he looks at his secretary you know he's not faithful to his wife from the dynamics and you know this guy is not faithful or you look at a company's um, reports balance sheet and you know there's a hole in it but the man is carried away by the graph and the q1 q2 thing but you know you know maybe from the person's behavior that if he behaves this way this company cannot be sound do you understand so we take decisions faster with less analysis because we think with the right brain so a lot of women are faster to come to a conclusion than their husband are though they look illogical to them but with all that power you need to drop it and let him come to the conclusion himself sometimes. You understand what I'm saying? You don't behave. Yoruba will say, You don't throw your entire power around. So I give an example. I say, if for instance, I need to travel tomorrow. And I say to my husband, I'd like to travel there. And he goes, oh, I wouldn't want you to go. Just wait with me for a while or something. And I have the money to go. And I sit down. That is submission. Because I have the ability to go the money, the funds, everything. I choose not to go because it, he asked me to. That's submission. However, if I say, I'd like to go to America next week and my husband needs to give me the money to fly and he says, I don't have any money, sit down. And I sit down. What I have done is I've obeyed, I've not submitted. So to be a submissive woman, first be powerful. That is what a lot of people are missing. A lot of people are not submissive. They just don't have what it takes at all. 
They're just obeying. And they're passing it on to women who have achieved 10 times what they have and saying they are not submissive. No, you are not submissive to you just don't have enough power to be dangerous to you don't have enough resources to display your unsubmissive nature. nature. That's all. You don't have enough resources to display your submissive nature. You are not submissive, you are obedient. Being a mom is a divine blessing. Don't miss it for any reason. Don't say because I can't conceive. Don't say because even if you're single and you have the capability to adopt and time is going, do so. You don't need anybody's permission because it's the love. They say mother is the most beautiful world in the, in the most beautiful word in the English language, and I believe. Because there's no love like the love of a mother to give unconditionally to another human being who can do nothing for you. Whose life like this is virtually, is literally in your hands. When they hand that child over to you, if you put your hands on his nose, he's gone. His life depends on you. There's nothing like that. Honestly, there's nothing so fulfilling. There's nothing so... I pray that every mom out there who has devoted themselves to their kids and done the best will actually reap the fruit of their labor. They will not labor in vain. Nobody else will take their place. They will live to enjoy their children and their grandchildren because there's nothing like that. I think every human being needs to be at that level where you are giving without hope of getting anything back. And that's what motherhood does to you. I really wanted a girl. In fact, I thought about I thought about it this morning. I thought about TJ. And when I had TJ, he was the most my second born. He was the most lovely, meek, whatever baby. And my brother came and you know I was still in a huff that he was not a girl. And my brother came and said, Carry him, I feel sorry for him. And then he was looking like that truly. I said, like, love me, please love me, you know. And I absolutely love him now. I thought, I hope he didn't hear those words in those few hours because I knew I was going to have a boy. But I wanted to convince God to reconsider this matter. I bought a girl's christening layette, but I, I couldn't go as far as buying pink. So it was blue and white, you know. And he had um, that thing that they put, the headband they put. So I dressed him in it, Sha. We decided it was unisex for his christening, but we didn't put that on. But you see, I now realized I could never have been the mother of a girl. I can't cope. What's going on now? We ones on 14 year olds and 15 year olds on 16 year olds struggling with makeup with your child. She wants a Louis Vuitton bag. Boys are good. I enjoy my boys growing up. What did we have? We had one khaki pair of trousers, one navy blue, one black. If you want to be really funky, it was khaki green. That's the way we see the Queen of England, the President of Lithuania, anybody. You just change the top. That's it. So the boys have proven very efficient, very expedient. And they're nice. My own boys are very nice. I can show you text messages from my son. Miss you, miss you, mom. Miss you too. They're not boys that will say you can't come with with me here. You can, you know, we hang out together. Go and watch John Week Two. Go and watch, although I close their eyes, you can't. You can't watch them. They are men because they've got the beards and everything. I don't know, but I think I thank God for them because it's sort of when I think that I'm getting old. Then I look at them and I say, not without reason. Not without reason. If KJ is going to be 20 to Luwalashe, I can't stay at 27 now. Something must give. KJ is, you know, very finicky, almost OCD to Luwalashe, the first child. You see his pictures, right? As a child, I've dressed him off and he seems to know he's dressed up. As a one year old, pull around Florent, Air Jordans, this and that. He puts them on his DP now and says, See me, this is what I did. I'll be wearing JC Penny, but I'll make sure. Seriously, if I have to go to Hoboken, all those funny malls to make sure I get the right thing for him, I'll wear that. And I'll be wearing this funny JC Penny, who says, Sorry, skirts. But he's dressed, you know, like that. And you take him that way to his minder. When you pick him up in the evening, he's still looking like that. TJ is blessed when it comes to that, because you take him to his mind and come back, it's as if a dust stop hits him. 
you know so they're different so one plays rugby the other one plays soccer and tj is the rugby he's done so well he got a medal for rugby lancashire this and that he's good with 15s with sevens it's, it's just tj is a sportsman you know so tj wants to be an engineer kj is studying tulu alashe is studying business you know so they have unique but they're both fun and they love each other and when we all get together it's like we have so sort of diversity that's why i can spend that much time with my family there's so much diversity in that group of just four it's like nobody else is needed they respect women they 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 transfer the way they feel about me to women so they don't look down on women they don't whatever they respect women that doesn't mean they won't recognize a silly girl but they think you should take care of women my sons will not let me carry my shopping they take it from me immediately it's not it's not do you need help with that they just take it from the shopkeeper or from the teller or cashier rather so they don't even it's not like that so i hear that you know they're well behaved and i think they are actually myself my children are nigerians and they need to understand their culture you know the balance i think the whole idea is of exposing children to more than one culture you so that i have the strength of both not that they trade off do you see so my kids prostrate and people are like what i had to even tell them, you don't prostrate for you old people you don't you know because so, <laughs> if not they will do that my first one understands Yoruba, but the one, the one thing he tries to say all the time, you mommy, a Korean woman. He doesn't have to put it well. That means that guy is looking at you. I said, that's the only one you can see. We were in Barbados together for a half time when he was like 13 or something. And the tour guide was just being nice to me. My son refused to talk to this tour guide throughout. So that one was trying, all these chatty Caribbean guys was trying to draw him out. So tell her, what do you do? So tell her, what is wrong? I had to say, Tolu is not hitting on me. He's being nice. Very protective. Especially my first son. My second son is happy, good lucky. I don't think he even notices anybody looking at anybody. I went to my son's uni and I was cooking for him. What I was doing, I don't even understand. Because I'm not going to cook for the term, am I? Just some maternal thing. So we're cooking jollof rice. We, we know we had steak, we had pork, we had this. So, you know, they have a kitchen where you can do that. And then this girl comes in, maybe threes or something, comes in, takes a look, says hello to him, ignores me and goes out. And then she comes back later. And then Tolu goes, three said, this is my mom. And she goes red, beetroot red. I, I didn't know, I thought, I thought maybe, I thought, ah, uh, I thought, ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, I mean mom. And then I was seeing TJ off on Tuesday, yesterday, no, day before Tuesday. And uh, a lady was seeing off her, her sis, brother. And she goes, I said, I'm embarrassing him by being here. She goes, are you his mom? I said, yes, I'm his mom. You don't look it. You look too young. I thought, toast him again. But then my friend says, but why should she toast you? What, what does she have to gain from toasting? This is my friend trying to rationalize the way I deflect every, you know. I started business at 25. The truth is, I always gave my very best wherever I worked. It never occurred to me that I was working for someone. I never thought about it that way. To me, it was mine. I owned it. I owned every project. I owned everything. I, I, there was nothing left to give. I'd given everything I could on every project. Then I realized, though, that every single design I did at a point, the client will say, was it ESP? How did you know what I was thinking? I, I did one for the Deputy Governor of Lagos State and she wanted to give me a bottle of wine. And I, How did you know? I was going to say I wanted the door this way. But my salary remained static. So, in one word, regardless of what I was doing, I wasn't going to get... It wasn't... What, my remuneration was not responding to my input. And I realized that only as an entrepreneur, does your remuneration respond to your input? Or as a partner, which is being an entrepreneur too, or if you're working somewhere where you have a share of the profit. One, I saw that my input was not being reflected in my remuneration and the business person in me just couldn't fathom that out, you understand? And two, I did all my very best. So I think I learned a lot because I kept throwing myself at the work in a short time. And I just wanted my talents and my skills to speak for me, to work for me. And I was bored. 
I didn't leave where I was working to go and start my own firm. Not really. I just wanted to leave. I just I had enough. I had enough. It was a young lady in church who said to me, why not start yours? I was like, <laughs> I thought she was. It didn't make sense. Then I sat. It was a Wednesday service. So before church started, I started thinking about it. Why, why can't I start mine? So, and the thought came, why not? I can only fail. Why not? At that time, I was earning 4,000 naira. And I knew that a security man, a gate man in Ikoyi would have been earning at least 4,000 naira from selling biscuits. So I thought, let me just go and make something happen. In fact, I wanted to sell cars. I wanted to do anything. I just wanted to leave. But when she said it, why not start yours? I thought, why not? My boss had told me then, he was the president of the URA, that I was the best designer he had ever met. And as the president of the International Union of Architects, that was pretty powerful stuff. And I thought, if, if, at least I'll have fun creating. I'll have fun being rewarded for my own mistakes and my own successes. It will be mine. I own my failure and my success. Let me go and see how it will work for me. But you see, in that is a lesson of women supporting women. She had just started hers, a small thing in Ikoyi then. In fact, her office was in Ikoyi Hotel, some consultancy. And she didn't say she wanted to be the only consultant. She wanted me to, to do something. You see, women need to support women because nobody understands a woman like a woman does. Your husband can try and understand you. Because I look at women, I love my husband, my husband loves me, everybody knows. But when people behave as if, Oh, my husband is the only one I need in life. I laugh because you know it is not true. You are faking it. You are teaching the young woman the wrong thing. Then they get into marriage, draining this poor man, wanting him to be their sister, their mother, their girlfriend, their everything. It can only be a man, your husband, and probably your father and your brother. But he's still a man, which means he won't, may not notice when you fix your hair differently. He may not notice when... And then you want that validation and you want this man to be everything. Your neediness is going to kill him. He will run away from you. You need sisters. You need real women, real people in your corner. If you, and let me get this thing with friendships. If you are blessed to have three friends in your life, you have more than the Lord Jesus Christ. He, took, he had Peter, James and John. If God had Peter, James and John, who are you? So many of the people you call your friends are not your friends. You need to define properly. Their acquaintances, their gym bodies, their party bodies. They go to the spa with you. They're not your friends. Your friend has your back at all times. Your friend knows you are your lowest and your best and is still with you. You need to be careful who you tell your secrets to. Because women use secrets against other women when they quarrel. And you will invariably quarrel. If, sorry, and you will invariably quarrel. The day is going to come. So they say you be careful about who you talk to because of tomorrow's quarrel. That's it with women. But you do need women to support women because a woman understands what it is like to be pregnant, to be in pain. To, they understand what it means to be a woman. I wonder why are we like a bucket of crabs sometimes as women? Why is it that some women are going nowhere and they don't want you to go to. You know, if you put a bucket of crab somewhere, you don't need to cover it because as the crab is, one crab is trying to leave, the others are going nowhere when they pull him down again. Good. So why are we like that? I think it's because society has taught us from Stone Age days, and we've taken it to find Africa because of the scarce resources, to see the man as the meal ticket. So the man has become the prize. If the man is the prize, then every sister is a rival and not an ally because we are fighting for the same prize, the man. So you tell your young girl, no, just go to university, do your nuclear physics, it doesn't matter. It's about you used to do last, last. Just go and marry, 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 marry. The lesson is the man is the prize. The man is the prize. The man is the prize. The man is the ultimate goal. Every other woman is a contender with me for that prize. She's not an ally, she's a contender. So until we free ourselves and teach our young girls that marriage is not your purpose it is a vehicle to destiny it is a vehicle to purpose it could be an accessory a way of getting to purpose it could make you or break you though until we get to that point that the woman realizes that her purpose is not just marriage every other woman will continue to be a contender and will continue to be like a bucket of crabs that's my theory
The legacy I would like to leave behind beyond designing that iconic building that says Nigeria is to help define, to define that global architecture that has an African origin. What I mean is a truly global architecture with global relevance, but is truly African. There's nothing called African architecture today. We're all people, look out. You could be landing in Dubai or Sugarland in Texas. People are confused. They're just mimicking things they see from all over the world. Our insecurity is showing in our buildings again. The neocolonialism is showing in the buildings again. We're building, designing stuff that is not relevant to local context, relevant to aspirations as a nation, relevant or to, as a continent, or relevant to the global times. If you look at traditional African architecture, it was relevant to the time, the available technology, the climate, the, the available materials, the lives of the people. In one word, we'll have a courtyard maybe, because it rains, we collect water. Do you get what I'm trying to say? If Africa is going to house its urban poor, if Africa is going to develop in this next 20, 30 years, using the methods that the West used, climate change is a joke, we would destroy the planet. So unless the West encourages Africa to find its own ego and be confident in itself, such that it evolves its own solutions, we will kill the planet with what we have to do. Number of masses we need to house, which we must house in a sustainable way. With the number of skyscrapers that are going up and the drain it has on power resources and everything, it is in the West's best interest to teach Africa to be proud of what it has so that instead of taking contrived sorry so so that we can evolve our own solutions so that is what i want to do let african architecture teach the world something because one sixth of the world cannot be silent in the global discourse on architecture when i say that for instance you look around and the architecture is underwhelming it, it's very people don't even know who an architect is or what architecture is people fawn over buildings that have been lifted from georgia and england and i'm wondering duh didn't you go to Bath or have you not seen Regent's Park? That's where it's from. You know, people do those kind of things. You see, with architecture, architecture is an, a science that is an art. It is art to living. That's what it is for, for me. It's livable sculpture. What is most important in architecture is not the form but the parti. The parti is the concept, the point of departure. Why did you do what you did? Once you have a reason for what you did, nobody can judge it anymore. Do you understand? So half of the things architects do are actually aimed at architects. Everybody else thinks they're ugly, but we architects know this is the reason. Do you understand what I'm saying? So uh, there is a concept. Good architecture is governed by an overarching concept. There's a reason for everything that you did. Why is it white? This is why it is white. Not because the house they told me to copy down the road was white, which is what we get a lot. People manipulating the form, forgetting that you need to live in it. And that for us in AD Consulting, your building is a reflection of your persona. So if you're, it's a marketing tool. So for instance, if you're a, a big boy, let's say to say, and it's your house, what it is, is this is how I want to be seen. Do you get? If you're an M M MNC, the people like, um, we work for Coca-Cola, International, not Nigerian, but Clean Company, Coca-Cola International, L'Oreal International. And why they like our work is because we can transmute the brand, transform the brand into a physical environment. So that when you enter, the essence of who the person is or who the firm is or who the company is hits you. You don't have to be told what they stand for. You are told, you understand. You can understand a bit of who I am by walking into this building because I designed it. So if I pay attention to detail, you know. If I want you to be comfortable, you know. If opulence is important to me, you know. Whatever, you get what I'm trying to say? It says a lot about you. Your built environment is beyond a billboard. A billboard, you bring it down, but your building satisfies, tells your internal customers, that is your family or your employees or your team who you are, and the external customers. Do you get what I'm saying? And it outlives you. It's actually a portfolio that keeps, a part of your portfolio that keeps appreciating. At the same time, keeps marketing you. So it's something you have to think about. And there is a concept.
What I would say to someone who would want to settle, let me put it, settle now, because the future looks bleak, is first, the only place where it's always sunny is the desert. So if your life is not going to be a desert, the climate will change. The weather will shift from time to time. It doesn't stay static. It's going to be static, you're not going to be productive. We need everything. It's very funny, it's like the stock market, it keeps dipping like this, but it's invariably going up. And that's life, especially when you're a person of faith. The second thing is you need to have someone who is higher than you that you believe in. If this is all to life, humanism, we, who we are, is a useless and wasted life. There must be something that you're willing to die for. That is when you will really leave. And then that's when you know to be able to say no to something that is lower than what you really are. Because it's that person who created you that can show you what you are meant for. There are things you won't do now if you knew you were going to be a queen. Don't do those things. Don't do those things. There are things you won't do now if you're going to be female president. There are things you won't say on Instagram. There are pictures you won't post. There are tweets you won't send out. There are people you won't associate with. Take those decisions now. Take a decision for your bright future and not for your, for, 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 because of your dismal presence. And then remember something. The so social media isn't real. People post their lives at the best or they post something that is fake. So don't ever believe a lie. Believe real life, connect with people on a real level and get to know real people. Then get a mentor. You need to do so. I think Isaac Newton is the one who said, if I've come far, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. You know, we have a saying in Yoruba land that what an older person can see sitting down, a young man can see it by standing up. It's because of experience, what you've been through. So you see, it's mediocre people who learn from experience, really bright people learn from other people's experience. You don't let it happen to you before you learn. It's happened to somebody before. And getting a mentor is not about getting close to somebody who endorses you. People do that a lot these days. There are people you will never meet who will mentor you. They have books, they have tips, they have videos. Acquaint yourself with that. Because even when they're in the room, they're not dispensing wisdom all the time. But more than anything, it's believe in yourself so that the decisions you take are not for your today, but for your tomorrow. Because we make decisions and afterwards, those decisions will make, make us. Today, you are a sum total of all the decisions you've taken. What you said no to, what you said yes to, brought you to this particular spot today. And what will take you to where you want to go are your decisions. So it matters. Uh -uh. I remember when I was 20 something, one allergy was toasting me and he would whatever, whatever. But you know what? I didn't believe there was anything allergy was offering me that was not in my future. So I didn't see why I would let go of being the first wife of my husband, let go of marrying my own young person, marry someone so much older than me, not because if you love him, that is fine, but not sell myself for something that was invariably going to be mine. I could see it, I knew. I believed in myself. So when you sell out, what you are saying is you don't believe in yourself. You don't believe you have what it takes. You definitely do not believe you have what it takes. If you have to sleep with a man to go to Dubai, sleep with him for a Chanel bag, or do anything, not even a kiss, for what you don't believe in. Do what you believe in, you know, and believe in who you are in the future, because you will get there. Don't let anybody look down on you today, because you are, you are like a book that is on the table of contents. Why are you behaving as if you are on conclusion? Or not a lot can happen in a day a lot can happen in a year to five years if you take the right steps at the right time I find it a very sexist question to ask if a woman can have it all because nobody asks a man that can you have it all and the very laws of science show that nobody has it all because you can't pursue two, three focuses at the same time. Do you get what I'm saying? So to ask that question to me is very chauvinist. 
I would say if you're asking a specific question, which is, can a woman have a career and a family? I'll say, oh, of course. So God who created you with a womb, who knows that you can carry children with it, knows that you will want to have children. But at the same and it is your legitimate right to pursue that, that dream to have children. But he also created you with a brain and with skills. Not to waste. That means that also is a legitimate part to pursue. I ask women who, well, you, you studied, when they gave you the exam slip, was it pink? They say, this is for women, this is for men. So the nuclear physics for females, answer that question. You passed the same exams that men passed, wrote the same test that men wrote. Why do you have less of a right to bless humanity with what you have than a man has? Why must you choose? It just doesn't make sense to me. If God gave you all that equipment, it must be because he expects you to deploy every single part, the brain, the skills, the mental agility, and the ability to bear, and the ability to nurture. It's not either or. There may be seasons in which you're forced to temporarily focus on one to the exclusion of the other, but invariably, you will deliver on both if you choose to. You see, they said a patriot is one who believes that his country is blessed because he was born in it. I believe I wasn't born here by accident. So I do believe in Nigeria. It's a clumsy situation. It has no definition or ideology. Sometimes I say, what does it mean to be a Nigerian? People are not even taught to ask that question. You know what it means to be a German? A Bundesliga, Bundesbank, Bundes this. You say things like accuracy, precision. That, that is what it means to be a German. Or to be an Italian. A bellissimo bella. You know, it means craftsmanship, arty. You know what I'm trying to say? You know what it means to be an Italian? Okay, what does it mean to be a Nigerian? We have leaders who are not even asking the question. I think resourcefulness instead of aggression. You know what I'm saying? Assertiveness. We have very good parts, you know. We, we need to craft a national vision first so that the next generation even knows, or we know, what's the next generation? Even we know what it is, what it means that we're building a nation. We're a geographical mass as it is now. We need to become a nation. From a very personal standpoint, I feel very old. But I've felt old since I was 32, so that's nothing. At 32, I was depressed that I was going to be 40 in eight years. Now I think of it, I should have enjoyed myself, you know, but it's done, it's done. What I think about being old is that just do what you are called to do at the time you are called to do it. But there's something I've found about being old. All of a sudden, I can own my space by sheer gerontocracy, you know, just like being an African and I'm older than you. That's a new feeling. Though the youth get along with me because I respect them. I really do respect the youth. You can never tell what a youth is going to become because the trajectory is not yet clear. For a 70 year old, it's done and dusted, really. How much more damage can you do in 20 or 30 years if you even get to be 100? But an 18 year old, who do you know that you're speaking to? You have no idea who you're talking to. You have no idea what they can become. You know, so. I'm settling into, like I said, my, my boys help me with growing older because I look at them and I think they need to grow older. For them to grow older, I too must move along. And I want them to grow older. Do you get what I'm saying? So they help me to put everything in perspective. To tell the real truth, and I hate it because people don't believe me when I say this, I feel like a non-achiever and 50 means, seems like, bagang, you're 50. What have you done with your life? That's what 50 is. Let's say I don't see myself as having fulfilled potential. So look, you need to analyze that statement. Potential being the key word. People have different potential. I know my potential. I have a non-fiction book. I have a fiction book I wrote as a 16 year old that adults will read. And when I tell the story till now, it's like, what? And I'm still going to write the book. I've got, so we're working on the project now. I write about architecture. And I write Christian books. There's that. Like I say, I can't sing to save my life. That's not it. But you are not going to. It's not everything I can do. But when some people have just one talent and they make it work, it makes me wonder what have I done with my. 
I want to optimize all the streams of potential that run through my life. Like I said, I can write. I know that from feedback, you know. The way I know my potential is the response to what I put out. It's not what I think I have. It is, I say something and there's this response. I do something and there's that response. And then you begin to wonder, if there's this response, there's something here. I may not see it because I have this blindness to seeing it, but others are seeing it. And if they're saying this, perhaps this is something I should develop. Perhaps this is something that has more potential that I am, you know, that I am optimizing, that I'm bringing out of it. Today I still met somebody who was hugging me because of the Mother's Prayer Manual. She almost swept me off my feet. I've met people who say, I pray with this book every day over my kids. Take my books, for instance. If that was the one thing I did, if it was a stream of income for me, then I'll push the books. I don't. I write them because it's bubbling in me and I have to just put it down. But then, I don't even see the business case to be made for books. So I'm very analytical like that. I kill things because I'm analytical. Take Awesome. Awesome was a meeting where 5,000 youth will gather. And it was so strong. There hasn't been a movement like that for youth since then. And I say it without, because someone called SKJ just told me that in Jewish Review like four weeks ago, that there's never been a movement for youth since, you know, like that. But I'm doing it again. I'm starting all over again, awesome, and you know, we're going to continue it. But 5,000, how many people gather 5,000 people? And I just stopped it. The youth, I just, they just have so much potential. And it's, it makes sense to get it right very early. I think very early I found out who I was, very early. So, and I see a lot of waste, unnecessary waste. How many youth are in your situation? Because technically in Nigeria, you're youth, you know that. So how many youth are in your situation who know what they're doing and actually doing it? Some are consumed with who to marry, how to marry, what to wear, what to cut, they want to make money. You know, you can waste your life very quickly as a youth. And sometimes when you waste it, you just never get it right again. How many people do you know that have never gotten it right again? and they took the wrong turn at 16 or something, then I just enjoy them. See these awesome meetings, right? I have goosebumps just thinking about it. There's so much energy. When you're done with an awesome meeting, we close at 3 a.m. The youth don't want me to go. They're yelling, stay, I have to go, I have to, go. I have to be in battle tomorrow, I have to this. They... You are energized when you're with the youth, not drained. How not I love them? They make silly mistakes, but what do they do? Oh, what I tell my boys is that, you see, you do have to respect people older than you. Why? Because you have knowledge, they have wisdom. All the knowledge you think you have, I can get from five minutes on the internet. You can't get my wisdom from five minutes on anything. So don't be so chuffed because you have knowledge. You know how to do this to a PS4 and then do that one to this and then you have... You have to make the difference between knowledge and, and that is information and knowledge and wisdom. Wisdom is knowing the next profitable step to take. So here is all this body of knowledge you've gathered. How do you apply it? That's wisdom. I remember um, a guy was toasting me. I was in TCA, Tower Cook and Associates then. And he bought me jewelry. Maybe had it delivered to the office and I called him and returned it to him. And then he said, ah. I said, I don't even, how, how long have I known you? Till today, he's my friend, you know, socially. He said, because he has never heard that. He believes that people believe that what in Kota Yeba, that's the first time he ever said, in Kota Yeba, that means whatever the bird can, pat, uh, can get is what the bird flies with. And I'm like, ah, I don't want you to have that kind of hold over me or privilege with me or anything like that. I don't want to owe you. And then again, I don't really need what you're giving me. Because I've learned to live without what you're giving me. Do you get what I'm trying to say? You don't, you shouldn't need what you can't do for yourself. Because then you lose the respect of the person who gives it to you. The guy knows. And then you know, the guy is wondering if you really are with him because of what he can provide or because you love him. He has it secretly at the back of his mind. My husband asked me once, did you marry me? That was maybe just two months married or three months. Did you marry me because of my car? I said, what car? Which car did you say you had, my dear? He laughed himself. I didn't have to say all that. 
So he knows for sure. We built things together. Do you get what I'm trying to say? So he can't doubt. Does she like me? Does she? Uh -uh, that one does not. It's not difficult to see potential. It's analysis of the person's character. What are his values? Is he working hard? Does he fear God? God is not wicked. Somebody is working hard, taking the right decisions today where he is with the set of opportunities that are open to him and he fears God and serves him. What is going to keep him down? You see, growth is natural unless there's an obstacle in life. If you cast a seed into the soil, it will grow unless there's a weed. Unless there's something wrong with the, the weather, it will grow. So all things being equal, somebody who has a right set of principles, life does not respond to breakthroughs and miracles. It responds to principles. That is why either you are Christian or not, if you do the right things, your life will go the right way. Because it's principles. The Bible says that the hand of the diligent will bear rule. The person who is diligent will rule over bishops and archbishops. It doesn't matter. He's diligent. God said it himself. So God has made it clear that there are principles that people should live by. So instead of looking at does he have a G-Wagon, does he live in Ikoi, does he live where? That's why that position may not be permanent because if he's living in Ikoi by a fluke, and I've seen many like that who are trying to sell their houses now in Ikoi because the guy was doing, you know, for Yahoo, you know. So he lives there. What will keep the person there is what is inside him so that even when life happens to him, he's able to recreate again using the same skill set and principles what brought him there in the first place because you are rich today does not mean you're going to be rich tomorrow things happen someone asked Harry Ford aren't you afraid that you can lose everything you have he said I'm not afraid I can lose everything I have but I know I have what it takes to recreate it all back in five years that's the kind of man you should be looking for you may not look like it today you may not smell like it today but that is what it takes. That's why girls and boys don't marry. It's men and women that get married. You have to be intuitive enough, analytic, mature enough to be able to look at someone and know that if this guy continues this way, he's going far. He may not have anything now, but he's going far. Look, when we were getting married, that uh, suitcase, I mean, what do you say, that you give to Yoruba girls, I was going to put the things inside now. But my husband pays his children's school fees today. I'm not helping him to do the things that a man should do essentially in life. The essential things, no. How did that stop? He's young, he's growing, I'm growing. We need to build together. You have to decide who you are. Are you an accessory to the man or are you an indelible part of his life? A man doesn't understand the meaning of love per se. They understand respect. What a woman calls love, is it flowers, is it roses, is it kushi kushi? They don't really get that, but they understand respect. So when your husband or your boyfriend respects you, you have his heart. Because he can love that whatever you say can be attracted to a passing stranger. But a queen mother, what is a queen mother? The woman amongst all the concubines and the other queens who sits by the side of the king. So she knows he's sleeping with other people. I'm not validating that. I'm saying traditionally, I'm not validating that. I am not. I need to make it. I'm not validating adultery. But the traditional king will have concubines. But there is a wife that maybe he's not even touching. But she's the one who has a voice. Because she has ceased to be a woman. To him, she's a mind. She's a soul. That is what you're looking for. And a man who will allow you not to just be a body, but a mind and a soul. Because another woman can provide him a body. Nobody else can give him that your mind because he listens to you because your opinion matters and then have a, an opinion that matters say make sense enough with the silliness make sense I talk to my male associates who are business people people don't hit on me so I'm like I must be really ugly but I know one day we're just in I said I have a feeling I know the answer to this but why don't you you know why, why doesn't this happen and they gave the answer I already knew, which is, why would we let, why would we lose relating to you, lose this relationship, you know, because of something as ephemeral, as a physical relationship, when you have value to bring to the table. So I will lose that value because I toast you then, you will leave me. That's not gonna happen. That the reason why we do that to the other women, because there is nothing else going on, it's just that body. 
So you tell me you're in business. I say, what do you do? I supply toilet roll to companies. Thank you. How's your own toilet roll? What's the USP of your own toilet roll that's different from another girl's toilet roll? There's none. Therefore, the guy says, okay, I want this for that. Because there's nothing different about the skill set, the value, the, the value you're adding to the, you know, to the table than anybody else's. So he says, okay, so I take a decision in your favor. Let me see what you got apart from this. Then he goes, they're asking me something. It's because you are not a solution provider. A man will not lose a superior solution because of sex. Is he a fool? He's a businessman. So he's going to lose his... Oh, oh, Habakai. He's not about to shoot himself in the foot. I would like my legacy to be that I help people discover, optimize, and fulfill their purpose. I would like my legacy to be that I help people discover their God-given gift develop it and deploy it to create a better Nigeria and to create a better community wherever they are. That they impacted their generations because I spoken to it or I touched their lives.